So welcome everyone to the OpenMP training series on uh, session five, Introduction to OpenMP Offload. Uh, my name is Helen He. I'm with the NERSC user training. So today, this is a general um, session of topics. We have done four sessions, and last session was also um, a guest lecture from Ruth Vandepas um, was possibly what could possibly go wrong using OpenMP. And so far we have touched introduction and tasking and new Martin SIMD. So today the session is session five, introduction to offloading with OpenMP. We have an event page. Uh, you can see links to slides, exercise and recordings of previous sessions available there. We also have a GitHub repo with slides and exercises as well. So introduction to speakers, uh, Michael Clem and Christian Turbovan have been giving us the series for about half a year long. Um, they're both language committee members and we routinely give um, technical talks and, and tutorials of OpenMP. Michael is not, um, has, has another obligation today, so he's not here. He'll be um, back next session. Christian Turbovan here, uh, he's, he leads the HPC group at RWTH Arhan University the co-chair of OpenMP Affinity Subcommittee and co-author of the book, Using OpenMP, The Next Step, published by MIT Press. So, quick logistics, everyone is muted. Uh, we'd like you to change your name in Zoom session to first name, last name, and if you have a nurse username, also put there. Uh, you can do it by click, click the participants, then more next to your name to rename, so we know who you are. Um, captions and full transcript have been enabled. You can click the CC button to toggle on and off. And also you can choose view transcript script. You can even uh, save the transcript script if you like. Uh, we're recording the session and recordings will be available in a few days after processing. Slides have been uh, uploaded to the GitHub repo and I'll upload them to the uh, event page as well. And um, people are welcome to unmute and ask questions, but if you feel uncomfortable to your voice being recorded, you can type question in Slack. Uh, we have a Slack channel, and I've, I've been posting the Slack channel invitation in the Zoom chat as well. Uh, we prefer Slack channel over Zoom chat to capture questions um, and also having threaded discussions there. And, and also post a survey link uh, towards the end of this today's session. So with that, this is my uh, brief introduction. I'll pass it on over to... So welcome to uh, session number five, if I remember correctly. So let me go to the next slide. Yes, five is correct. Today's topic is about offloading with OpenMP. And um, by, although some people might consider programming with two, four GPUs to be the most important aspect, uh, currently, uh, we believe it's important to start with maybe the basics, the fundamentals, or what I would call expressing the parallelism in OpenMP, because we learned about many concepts already. And uh, today, and also in session number six, we are going to review all those context, uh, concepts sorry, now in the context of GPU programming or offloading. But before we dive into this topic, yeah, I would like to review the uh, we call them the homework assignments of session number three very briefly and then i'll hand over to helen to also review one of the tasks and then i believe uh, we will come back to me starting the explanation of the device and execution model how to express parallelism for the device and how to optimize data transfer see agenda or agenda on the web is also talking about the loop construct but we move that to session number six and finally, again, we have a task for, uh, prepare the task as a homework assignment if you're willing to try out what you just learned. So uh, you know already the code, but we have many, uh, I think four or five new tasks for that code to try out in the context of OpenMP on GPUs. So let's see.
start with the review, and uh, this is a call for questions. Please understand that I do not have the capability to monitor the Slack here for whatever technical or privacy concerns. It's not installed on this machine, but uh, Helen can read out the question later on. I can take a look into the Zoom chat, and I will break and, and make a break uh, right here to see if there's anything going on in the chat. Uh, no. There's a comment that there's apparently a drop down at the top of Zoom where you can choose which shared screen. Yes, so in my Zoom window, it has a meeting tab, it is a my screen tab, and it's RWTH Christian Toberman's tab. Click on Christian's tab to see his slides. Okay. Yeah. Good. Then let me take a look at the first. Um, example that I prepared, I think technically that was Michael. So we look at the pi code to uh, parallelize the approximation of pi uh, earlier on already. And uh, this time we didn't want to express parallelism, but instead to express uh, vector parallelism. Yeah? And uh, last time we talked about SIMD, single instruction multiple data. Uh, that is the construct in OpenMP to vectorize a loop. Yeah? So you see the difference, Pragma OMP, well, we're doing OpenMP programming after all, there's no parallel, and that means there's no uh, spawning of threads and so forth. Yeah? So we express SIMD parallelism in terms of SIMD lanes. We can uh, influence the degree of SIMD parallelism, meaning the vector lengths and so forth. Um, I could talk about that later, uh, last time. But if you would just say uh, Pragma OMP SIMD, uh, in several cases, the compiler would have an issue vectorizing this loop. Why is that? Uh, so first, we have a variable fx that is defined in each iteration in red, and then redefined uh, uh, in the next iteration, and then red again. So basically, in each iteration, I think I said that before, and uh, when you remember how we parallelize this code, you know, we understood that we have to privatize this variable, and this is the same again here. The difference is we are not privatizing it for every thread, but we are privatizing it for every vector lane. And you, will, you could see the difference if, if you would combine parallelization with, with vectorization, then you would have private variables for threads, and then even more private variables per thread, but for every vector lane. What uh, could also um, cause the compiler the, the trouble with this code, actually, uh, in, in many more cases, and uh, this is true in all the parameterization, <laughs> is to introduce a reduction. Uh, so that means F sum has an initial uh, value defined before the loop, typically the neutral element regarding the oper uh, reduction operation, which is a zero in the case of an addition is being defined and read, yeah, written to and read in every iteration, and is consumed afterwards. So privatization would be an issue because then all those partial results are gone. And uh, we explained that in the context of threading, we need a reduction. Uh, here we need it for uh, multiple Cindy lanes, or do the reduction over multiple uh, Cindy lanes. Don't get me wrong, modern compilers could probably do this. Um, because it's a simple code, yeah, but with that, uh, you can actually uh, improve performance or uh, and ensure that the compiler is able to generate um, vector code. Yeah. The other example was Jacobi, and uh, here we're so, um, we were not uh, optimizing for Cindy parallelism, but instead for NUMA, non-uniform memory access. Yeah. Remember that performance for, uh, differs depending on the location of the core that is executing the thread performing memory accesses and the actual memory uh, location. And there was a memory that's closer to the core and memory that's further apart, but still we have shared memory. Uh, so the physical memory location is managed by the, or determined by the operating system at the time of the first touch typically. That's what we learned last time. And if we lay out the data structure in memory, yeah, and uh, access them in parallel accordingly, then we increase and increase the aggregated memory bandwidth available to our application. 
just an explanation, I, I believe, in two sentences of a rather complex topic. In order to do that, yeah, it's important to parallelize the initialization. That means um, here those arrays U and F, or U all and F and U, sorry, depending on the code version, here it's U and F, are initialized in parallel. Uh, so we, are, uh, we can possibly collapse the then and I loop because they are independent of each other. That means they form a rectangular iteration space. And that means the thread that's accessing U00 is actually determining the physical memory behind this logical address to be the closest one yeah, uh, to the core that is executing this thread and the thread um, accessing, meaning initializing uh, UJI for a given uh, J or and or I with a distance larger than the page granularity in Linux, again, is determining uh, the um, physical memory location for that particular chunk of memory, um, again, respectively for the core that's executing that thread. So the goal is to parallelize the initialization and bind the threads over the machine so that we can actually distribute the physical memory over all the available NUMA nodes. And we discussed that, and I'm sure we would quickly emphasize that uh, even a single socket system nowadays is a NUMA system, so at least two memory controllers, many processors, and even four, possibly uh, more, um, depending on which system you're using. So even if you're using NTI plus OpenMP, NUMA can be um, a relevant suitable. So we're parallelizing the initialization here. Here we are parallelizing the memory access, so it's important uh, to use a memory access pattern that's in this case, the same. In any other case, as close as possible. Um, when you compare the uh, parallel computation and the initialization, yeah, and making sure that threads are bound. So we have the same access pattern here with an OP4 and the OP4. Again, um, you know, this is copying uh, U to U all, and this is the actual computation, uh, meaning the update in each iteration. And uh, since this is a very simple code, um, yeah, you can ensure that the memory access pattern is the same. I didn't bring any performance measurements, but uh, um, um, if I remember correctly, we did a brief live demo of uh, Jacobi being parallelized. And uh, if you would enable NUMA optimization and disable that, uh, you can actually see a performance difference of, let's say, for four threads between yeah, let's say about 15%. Yeah? So the, the NUMA ratio between local to remote memory access obviously differs from system to system architecture, uh, but something like 15% per, uh, percent with four threads is what you can see on many different systems. Questions on either Cindy with Pi or NUMA optimization of Jacobi? Going once, going twice. Take this as a no. Helen, is it correct? I switch back to you uh, yes, for the stream um, experiment. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, there's also no uh, Slack questions so far. So, yeah. Okay, very good. I stopped sharing, right? Mm -hmm. Presentation mode. <laughs> Now we have presentation. So yeah, so besides the SIMD exercise and Jacobi exercises, uh, we have two more NUMA exercises for session three. We have heard lots of presentations on NUMA topics and in the session three talk and in session four talk. Um, so these two exercises, I just want to tap more the more adapting to parameter CPU node. So uh, giving you more direct visual and uh, how uh, NUMA plays on parameter. So parameter CPU node, um, it has 128 cores and two processors total. So let me give you maybe the second slide first. So this is a parameter CPU compute node. Um, this is a diagram I drew from the results from the previous slide. I'll show you what does that mean. So this is a, a CPU node. It has two sockets and one processor per socket. There are uh, 128 cores total and 64 physical cores per socket or, or per processor. So let me go back to the first slide. How do we get those information? There's a command called NUMA control 
uh, with the flag dash H, H means uh, hardware information. Uh, first of all, you get onto a compute node uh, with uh, some S alloc um, interactively. Then you run this command, it all, the output looks like this, available eight nodes. Nodes here actually means numeric domains. Um, one per numeric domain within it, memory access is um, sort of uh, uniform, but then accessing memory from further numeric domains uh, costs longer um, time access. Anyway, it tells you um, on each of the compute CPU node, it has eight nodes, eight numeric domains, and these are the numbering of each numeric domain. We call them logical core numbers. So numeric domain zero has you know, 16, well, 0 to 15, and then 128 to 143. Uh, actually, 1 to 15 are its, is, is its uh, physical core numbers. So out of eight total CPU uh, numeric domains, you see the, the logical core, uh, the cores from 0 to 127. So 128 physical cores are divided by uh, as eight numeric domains. But then these other black numbers are those sort of, we call them, the hardware hyperthreads of each um, physical core. So zero and 128 is actually the same physical core. Um, zero is its physical core number, 128 is its logical core number. Uh, so these numbers are useful. So sort of um, when I show you this next slide, uh, we'll just uh, have some more visualization of what these numbers for. And then when later on, we, we, when we run some test codes and we, we you know, to, to see what are the affinity and, Bindings, these numbers are, will actually give the information what, where, where the threads are binding to which core or which logical core. Um, so the, this command, numa control dash h, also gives you no, no distances. Uh, horizontal 0 to 7, vertical 0 to 7. And diagonally, this 10 means from 0 to 0 and from 1 to 1, sort of relative memory access cost is 10. It's not absolute number, but the relative. But then you can see from zero to like to four is say 12 and zero to um, one, two, three is 12 and zero to four, five, six, seven cost more because four, five, six, seven numeric domains on, on, are on the next par processor. Uh, zero, one, two, three are on the first processor, four, five, six, seven on the next processor. So um, each numeric domain accessing a domain within the same processor is a little bit better than cost when you actually try to access um, numeric domain on the next processor. But again, from itself, it's within the numeric domain on the diagonal, you see the cost is the lowest. So you see this number 0 to 15 and you know 112 to 127. I'll show you the next slide again, just some calm. So here, <clears throat> socket zero has four process, uh, one processor and it has four numeric domains. And you see core zero to 15, uh, it's physical core numbers and 128 to 143, it's uh, it's logical core numbers. Uh -huh. So these are the best new, um, memory access. And from here to accessing one or two or three new domains costs a little bit more. And from here to um, accessing new domains here, four to seven um, physical cores, 64 all the way to 127 costs uh, the most. So naive, um, th these are like, when you run your application mm -hmm. on Perimeter, you really want to make sure you have the optimal affinity. If it's affinity is wrong, sometimes it costs you performance a uh, huge impact. Here are some of our uh, previous nursing machine, and these are applications, uh, like some, some of them are ranging between one to three, but then one of the application is actually 33 times better if you have optimal affinity settings. The two exercises here, uh, we had XT high, and it, it basically this exercise tried to display an affinity, ver verify the affinity settings. This is the source code um, I adopt. I, I actually adapted from uh, a HPE provided code, which is a hybrid MPI OpenMP. So I made it to just pure OpenMP. It basically, when you run it with multiple threads, it'll print hello from thread, whatever number on uh, which um, host, and my core affinity is to you know bind to which uh, core or which logical cores. Um, you can when you compile it, if you just use the GNU compiler, the flags dash f openmp. Uh, we also have a uh, the regular um, one one layer openmp, and I also have a nested openmp source code. We can do the 
compilation and you will run it to acquire a um, CPU node first. Um, doing this exercise using S alloc is best because you can see the progress um, interactively. So you can set different number of OpenMP threads, different number of proc bind and settings of, of OMP places and you run it. And the sort command here is just to try to make sure the, the, the output looks more uh, easily to, to digest. Otherwise, it could be random um, uh, ordering of the number of, of how, with multiple threads running. Um, we have uh, two questions. So Stefan raised. Okay. Yeah, I can see. Uh, Stefan, have a question? Yes. So how do you prevent the uh, red migration? If you have to have one task on the whole node and they say you pick all 128. Mm -hmm. So you can by by how you set the OMP places. If you set this a four, and this are only migrate within the four. If it's the OMP places equals sockets, the sizes might be uh, uh, within the socket. I'll show you um uh, yeah the the same table solution from from GitHub. No, this is not calculated. This this is the the new control dash h command is the output from the sort of giving you a, a, a just your words a relative number of memory cost and rather than of them do the cost three times more of it. it's it's not a if this is like this is what might have been might have been just I know it's the cost of accessing that for the uh you know you to them. And the, the plan is you know the cost just to be uh some cost of price. The different um hardware um having different numbers. It's basically sort of like my my CPU um to your uh frequency of my remote memory access distance. Relative cost. These are all part of the hardware. No. Okay. Back. Yeah. So there's also um verification method. I um. So one way we have on um, that we actually can pre compile the binaries with different uh, compilers, GNU compiler, uh, NVIDIA compiler, Cray compiler, and the way also we have pre compiled pure OpenMP code pure MPI code and hybrid MPI open MP code. So uh, if you have, you know, all the settings for your application, you have set number of threads, you have setting proc bind, et cetera, without running your actual application code, you can just put in the, our application pre-built code and using the, 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 the S run command, you prepare to run and find out the affinity settings that will be the same as if you run your own application. So that's one way to uh, verify affinity. Um, so these for from these code, this is actually that we can actually um, compile the XT high code. So you will see it actually prints hello from rank zero, hello from rank one, the rank and our MPI rank numbers, and then thread number for zero one two from MPI rank zero, thread number one zero one two, blah blah for rank one and on which host that uh, if you have multiple uh, compute nodes, it'll give you, you know, I don't know, maybe rank zero is on one node and rank one maybe on another node. And these are affinities. Uh, so basically rank zero thread of MPI, uh, thread zero of rank MPI zero is binded on the core zero and 128. If you go back and check our diagram or check these means actually this is bind on the first so first physical core. And then this is on the second physical core. Quickly, I'll show you the sec second uh, verification methods. In OpenMP standard, we have uh, two environment variables. One is OMP display affinity. You can set it to true. By default, it's false. So you set it to true, and you have set you can set an affinity format however you like it with different um, um, layout. Then when you run it, whenever there's an um, affinity change, in your program, it'll print out the current um, affinity settings for the next uh, parallel region. So it'll put, because the format is host equals on which compute node and my I'm thread level one 
and which threat number, uh, threat zero, one, and two of threat number one. And then again, affinity is this. But there are a few more other um, other parameters that you can set, uh, like my ancestor, my team, et cetera. Um, I think Kristen actually showed this in the slides we sessions we talk as well. And this is an, an example of nested OpenMP. And with the OMP um, format settings, you can see level zero, uh, threat level one, and sometimes even you see threat level two of these affinity settings. So with that, I'm going back, going now to the uh, actual, actual um, the um, exercise um, to show you a little bit output. So this is X too, too high. Let's go to the solution. This is how we did in the source code. So you do, um, you compile on the login node. Once you log in, uh, XT high and XT high nested OpenMP. And then you would request an um, interactive node as alloc, dash capital C, GPU, blah, blah. And then we would check, you, you would run new SQL dash, dash H, you will see this result. Then let's run some threads, uh, tests. So export number threads equals eight, you just run it and without OMP places without proc binding, the default binding would be zero to 255. Basically it binds to all, the whole node. So you want it to be more um, fine tuned by bind, um, affinity binding. So now you would say OMP proc bind equals spread and you um, places equals cores. So then each thread will now bind to a one physical core, which combine uh, consists of two uh, logical cores, zero and 128 is the same physical core zero, right? Because I'm now places is cores, which means each thread will be um, bind to one core. And then when you do spread, it'll spread out 0, 16, 32, instead of they all lump together uh, on, the, on closer um, processors. When you spread them out, now you have MPI, uh, the OpenMP threads on, running on multiple NUMA domains. So you have more access to memory bandwidth on the whole com uh, compute node. If you set OMP place equals threads, now your affinity becomes only just onto the actual thread. When uh, one hyper thread, you don't have the, the logical cores to the physical core anymore. You just your thread bind to the, the one CPU on each core. And if you do sockets, now this is the socket. This is the, the socket one. Socket zero is actually the 64 physical processors. And socket one has another 64 physical processors, as well as the another 64 logical processors along with it. And if you actually want to set the special OMP places, you can always do that. If you say, I only, only want to use the first four physical cores, and you set that, now your, um, your affinities are only binding on these cores. So if you do close and threads, this is not actually good for your memory. Um, plus, you would you know thread zero on first physical core, thread one also on the first physical core, but on it's actually on thread logical core of that physical core. Uh, if you set two cores again, now you have you know, thread zero on first physical core, thread one on second physical core. Remember, this is with the OMP prop by equals close, so they are not spreading out. The first all the eight cores are running in the same um, numeral domain zero. With nested OpenMP, um, similarly, you can do actually prop bind and spread and close. This is recommended. The outer layer to be spread and the inner layer to be closed. And you can set different number of threads here. The outer, in this example, I set four um, threads outer and three threads inner. So when you run it and we, we sort it, you can, you can experiment with different uh, settings here and you can see the output with the, Outer layers, um, you spread them out, and the inner um, thread level two, you are uh, running these uh, threads with the you know threads closer to your the outer the master thread of the outer layer. And if you do close close, uh, which is actually not recommended because now everything is on the same numa domain uh, zero, right? You zero and one, all these. And also you have the overstepping threads on each other, which is not a good use of your physical course available on the node. So that's the first exercise. Um, any questions for the XT high? 
just uh, I think show you. So having this in mind, looking compare your output results with these numbers is good to know where your threads are binding to. Do you have any hands or questions? If not, uh, I'll go on with second exercise. Yes. I, I didn't notice any questions, so please proceed. Okay, second exercise. Let me see if I'm uh, still sharing. Yes, are you still sharing seeing my slides? The stream. This now this exercise basically yes. to, to illustrate the importance of first touch um in slide mode. Um you have seen this many times. This is the initialization loop, and this is the actual calculation trim add as, as a fused multiply add of uh, arrays, large arrays. So running time, you have the OMP power of four and then the you want the initialization first touch is so important. Just want to show you if you do do initialization with first touch, then doing nothing with OMP thread here, OMP power of four or whatever, then this initialization will be done by a masked thread only. Another way to do the first touch is you actually do the OMP um, power of four for your initialization. Now it's because it's being you're allocating these array um, arrays, then the <clears throat> the memory will be lo a local to the thread which initialize it. So this is the uh, first touch, right? So with first touch, when you do actual calculation, your um, array memory is uh, local to the numeral domain that your thread is at. So here is the one example. Um, this is with and without <clears throat> first touch. The <clears throat> orange line is without. <clears throat> I think I got it um, actually. Opposite. The orange is actually with first touch and blue is without first touch. So without first touch, when I try to run with <coughs> excuse me. Setting from using zero <coughs> certain number from zero all the way to 256, that's allowed on the uh from the CPU node. Without first touch, this triad um memory bandwidth is so low. Um, with the uh, first touch, you can see much, much higher. So here, because it's bandwidth number, the higher, the better. <clears throat> with a little bit smaller number of threads, um, the first touch is not catching up because it's still only using uh, half of the memory, uh, half of numeric domains, even if you use the first touch. <clears throat> but then once more and threads are used, once more um, numeric domains are used, first touch is so much better. But in the reality, first touch is so hard to do that. So our recommendation is because you have no, no multiple numeral domains um, to when you run, <clears throat> um, say hybrid MPI open MP code. So you probably should use one MPI rank per numeral domain, and then only use a number of threads available per numeral domain for, um, for your open MP. Then you don't have to worry about first touch because they're already within the each numeral domain. But if you use pure OpenMP, and def definitely first touch is so important. So second, um, we want also to, to show the um, <clears throat> oh, Stefan, you have a question? Well, ju just to be clear, just the, you know, when you do allocate, you allocate your array, you don't have to do it inside an OpenMP loop, right? It's just when you, you touch it. So if you do allocate whatever A, B, and C, that can be done outside of an OpenMP loop. And it's only when you touch it that you want to do it within an OpenMP loop. Right. Yes. OK. Um, so here I want to show you the, um, the impact with spread and close. Um, again, we're running all the way to, to from 0 to 256 on a CPU node. And using just say in a situation when OpenMP num threads equals 32 and places equals thread. So when you do spread, these 32 um, 
threads will be bind to the physical core 0, 4, 8, all the way to 124. So that will be across spanning all the numeral domains. But if you do OMP proc bind equals close, then it'll be all these 32 threads will be binding to first physical core, second physical core, all the way to the 16th physical core. They're all on the same numeral domain. So in that case, you're not utilizing all the memory bandwidth available on the whole node. That's why uh, this close is, is bad for the bandwidth uh, results on parameter. So again, we do recommend a spread or close usually. And we also recommend with first touch. That's the um, experience. I want to show you quickly in the example here of the numbers. So the exercise, what we do here is um, in the solution, just want to share a sample stream output. And we have a batch script. Um, in that batch script, we run multiple sets. First sets we run with first touch and close. And these are the settings and you see the numbers here. So the plot basically use, utilize these numbers. Um, they're pretty low and all the way like trying to catch up. Now you was uh, <clears throat> first touch with thread, uh, with spread, uh, first few numbers low, but then immediately it's, it's much higher. With uh, Both with first touch, uh, comparing with uh, close and spread. <clears throat> and then I, the, in the plot, we also compared with, um, with and without first touch. Yeah, okay, this example only shows the first touch uh, output, the sample. But then if you set the uh, running streams, you can see here what we run. Um, run set with these and run set two with settings. Let me see. Yeah, so you, you uh, I don't think we have a, a script here with running no without first touch. So we should have, you know, do your own, uh, do a without first touch exercise and just replace your um, binary with the without first touch command here. So re with re replace the stream with stream underscore NFT, no first touch to run the same uh, scripts and you get another set of output and the plot, you can try to see if you can reproduce the plot I've shown. So with that, I'm done with my um, exercise explanation. Any questions, please? If not, I'll pass on to Christian, um, the offload topic today. OK, so I hope you see my screen and you can hear me. Yes. OK, then let's take a look into offloading with OpenMP. And as I said earlier, we will start with the device and execution model. I have a very simple example uh, that, uh, you, that we're going to look at um, at several of the next slides. So let me briefly explain it. It's performing a SACSP operation. Yeah? So y equals a times x plus y for a certain number of elements, meaning the dimension of x and y. I guess that's uh, simple. There's a timing code um, in between, or uh, this is in between a timing code. So we measure the time here and the measure the time there, subtract the two values and print the time of the kernel in case you see any uh, performance numbers on the following uh, slide. So the timing is irrelevant. We want to get this onto the GPU, but before we do that, yeah, don't do this at home. That means never write your own SACS before a GPU. Um, you, we will see if there's, uh, we can do a little bit, but uh, um, this is an operation that has been hand-tuned by GPU vendors. Um, regardless whether it's a green, the red, or the blue GPU vendor, yeah, uh, there's always a library that is performing BLAST operations much faster than anything that we could do, uh, that we could achieve out of the box. Yeah? But again, this is a very simple code, similar to Fibonacci in the context of tasking, yeah, uh, illustrating um, or meant to illustrate the general concept. Uh, support for GPU programming with the, in, in the mean of offloading has been introduced with OpenMP version 4. If I remember correctly, that was released in 2008. So we can consider that as major as of now. Um, 
in uh, version four, we were talking about accelerators and coprocessors, although this kind of uh, device is not so important um, yeah, anymore. It's a host directive execution model, although it doesn't define that the CPU is a host and that the a different device is uh, the accelerator. Yeah, it could be vice versa. So you could use OpenMP to perform offloading to a traditional GPU to do I.O., for example, and there are a couple of architectures that actually do that. But here we're looking at traditional host plus a couple of GPUs. And that means the host is a traditional CPU-based system with some main memory. And we have one or even more accelerators of a uniform type uh, that can do something faster than the host and typically also have their own memory and they are connected with some interconnect. That means uh, we have to offload the compute kernel from the host to the accelerator, typically transform, transfer some data before that is being then uh, processed in the uh, accelerator's local memory and then we have to transfer the results back. Yeah? That's the simplest model and this is what we're going to look at. Um, no, this is how it looks like in OpenMP. So uh, at least when the slide is being uh, completed, uh, in order to transfer data, we need something that we call a data environment op in OpenMP. Yeah, we learned about that earlier on. So this is what uh, defines what data is shared and what's private. And you will see those keywords again later on. And we need some code to be executed that's typically referred to as the kernel. This is being achieved with a so-called target construct in OpenMP. In Fortran, we have an OMP target and an OMP end target. In C and C++, we have pragma OMP target, opening curly brace and closing uh, curly brace. So the target construct actually um, establishes a data environment at the beginning of the construct and the actual body, meaning uh, the part in the curly braces is the kernel, that means the code that, being that is being executed on the device. And at the end of the target construct, the data environment is being destroyed. So let me explain this with an example. Here we have the host memory. That means we have an array A with some data in it, yeah, zeros, ones, and actually a two. And it has some address on the host. And here we have the device memory. And in order to actually control the establishing of a data environment, we can use so-called map clauses with the direction information uh, at the target construct. So what's shown here is that we want a new array A, yeah, allocate an array A on the device that is uninitialized and not related to the data in array A on the host, yeah? but it's kind of uh, clipping out. I hope that translates correctly then the name of the variable A. So that will give us a new A allocated in the device memory during the course of the execution of the target kernel. If we have an exit, if we want to actually take the data of A, yeah? we will say map to yeah, so that is exclusive. We can say map two. That means at the beginning of the target, A is being allocated and the values of A are being copied yeah, or mapped, depending on if a copy is really necessary or not, from the host to the device memory. And uh, what I'm trying to indicate here is that this has a different address. Yeah? So it's a different variable A. We will come back to that why that is important later on. Then we actually do the compute. That means we execute the compute kernel doing something with A, supposedly. And at the very end, we want to map A or any other result back from the device to the host. So we um, actually uh, give the direction from. Otherwise, A would be, let me call it disposed, yeah, when the data environment on the device is being destroyed. So that's a general concept. Target establishes a data environment. We can control it with map clauses, executes a compute kernel, destroys the data environment, and then returns a control flow. I'll add no more details on the next uh, slides. Yeah? So I said that Pragma OMP target in C and C++. We have clauses to select the device. Um, 
Most implementations in OpenMP of OpenMP only support compilation for some, one single kind of de uh, device, like this particular NVIDIA device or so. Yeah. But if we have multiple, we can say this kernel, kernel goes to the first device zero, the second goes to the second, yeah, or the other kernel goes to the second device, device one, and so forth. We have map alloc to and from, or we can say to from, yeah, which means we have map to and map from for the list of variables denoted here. And from last time, you already remember uh, the if clause on the parallel region. If the expression evaluates to false, it will not go parallel. Here, if the expression evaluates to false, it will not execute the kernel on the device, but instead on the host. Why would that make sense? Well, first for debugging, but second, you could check if the problem is large enough to justify the overhead of going to the device, meaning copying the data back and forth. Yeah? And if it's not the case, uh, then the kernel will be executed on the host. And that means the OpenMP compiler or the OpenMP implementation ensures that your compute kernels are compiled um, yeah, let, for simple reasons twice. Yeah? That means once for the host and second for the device. Yeah? That's a default case. Of course, there can be complications. So let's come back to our example and see how that goes. So the timing code will be happening on the host. This is intended to be executed on the device. So we say pragmo and target, and then we execute this back on the host. So that means here, the target actually transfers the control flow from the host to the device and then later on from the device back to the host. What is the host doing in between? Waiting for the device. Yeah? So that means by default, we have a synchronous offload. Of course, we can make it asynchronous. And uh, this is what we will discuss next time. And uh, for that, OpenMP kind of recycles or reuses the task construct, yeah? which is an asynchronous execution of code. Uh, so we will revisit the context, uh, concepts here. In order to, I think I hinted to it, enable um, OpenMP GPU compilation, we have to enable OpenMP and actually say, this is uh, specific for the Clang, the offload architecture is, I guess this is something from uh, AMD, yeah? uh, this or that architecture. So you can consult your compiler documentation to see what is available. And I believe Helen has also some information on that. Um, afterwards. Now let's take a closer look at the variables. So what's happening here? This is a very simple code. Yeah? So X and Y are actually static arrays locate, allocated on the stack with a given size. Yeah? So the compiler can here identify variables that are used in the target region and kind of add mapping clauses invisibly. Yeah? So that means it will map a, X, and Y from the host to the device, but it will also map X and Y back from the device. It doesn't make sense to map X, right? So it, uh, map uh, X back, yeah? because we're not going to reuse X here. This is just an uh, input. Yeah? So if Y is initialized, uh, which I believe is a standard case, it makes sense to map X and Y at the beginning, but we can already save some overhead by not mapping X back. Yeah? So that's an argument for uh, doing the mapping explicitly. Uh, but in many, in this simple cases, the compiler can do that automatically. What the runtime is doing in this case is something that's called the presence check. Yeah? So that means the, uh, sorry, I have to change the zoom line, uh, the, the zoom layout here, now I'm back. Um, so the runtime will um, keep a mental note of which variable is already mapped on the device and which is not, yeah, which has been modified and has to be mapped back, uh, mapped back and so forth. Yeah? So there's a tiny little bit of overhead involved when the runtime is managing data um, and mapping between the host of the device. However, I would always recommend you to do the mapping explicitly and I guess for many codes, this is actually a requirement as we will see on the next uh, slides. Is there a question in the chat? Oh no, that was just a repetition of the info. Okay, this is the same for uh, Fortran. 
yeah um is there anything uh, special yeah i believe not but uh, so we here we have omp target and omp and uh, target yeah? so now let's complicate things a little bit yeah? back to the c code now with a slightly different data type and what I guess is more interesting, pointers. Yeah? What is if X and Y are pointers? Yeah? And we are using the C programming language. Then the compiler, I mean, or the OpenMP implementation, does not have here at this point the information how big or meaning what is the dimension of X and Y. If it doesn't know the dimension, yeah, it doesn't know how much data it does have an address, how much data to map, meaning to copy. And this is why we as programmers can and have to define the uh, dimension of the variable to be uh, mapped. So here we have to say x from element 0, um, yeah, sz elements. Yeah? And so that means this is the argument of number of elements that uh, are being processed or possibly the dimension of x and y. That also gives us the opportunity to just map a slice. Yeah? So we could also say from 1 to 9. That's also possible. In this case, now we have to actually uh, add this mapping clauses explicitly to give x and y the dimension. We have to map x only uh, from the host to the device. That's why we're using 2. And we have to map y from the host to the device at the beginning and from the device back to the host at the end. This is why we are saying 2 from um, and specifying the dimension or the size of uh, those variables in the mapping process. I think I said that the compiler, at least in C and C++, cannot determine the size of the memory behind the pointer. If we specify more memory yeah, or a larger dimension that's being defined, yeah, you know what happens uh, depends on the data that has been or that's present in the memory there. So we have to help the compiler but it also gives us the opportunity to improve efficiency. What was happening, sorry, I didn't say that, what's happening here, Yeah, if we map that to the GPU, good news is it will run, bad news is it will run really, really, really slow because it will employ only one GPU thread yeah? because we didn't express any parallelism here. We just change the control flow from the host to the device, but there's no um, parallelism. And that uh, on the GPU uh, from NVIDIA would mean one GPU uh, core or one GPU thread, depending on the terminology, would execute all those iterations. There's no automatic parallelization here. That means we have to express a parallelism. There are a couple of known uh, tools already. There are a couple of new tools and constructs that we are going to introduce next time. Multi-level is important for modern GPUs. I'll come to that in a second. Yeah. So we in OpenMP decided many years ago, and I believe that's a good decision, to separate the offloading done with target and the expression of parallelism. That means we can reuse the constructs that we already have, or we can uh, use new constructs that give the runtime more freedom and also more responsibility. Sorry, not the runtime, but the OpenMP implementation. More freedom and uh, at the same time, more responsibilities to express uh, the parallelism. So we have to explicitly create the parallel region, regions, that's important, on the target uh, device. Yeah? In theory, you can combine that with any OpenMP construct, like with section, you can add ifs yeah, and so forth. But always remember, there's no magic involved. If you write code that's not performing well on the GPU, yeah, in principle, because it has a divergence and so forth, very bad memory access, and then uh, you use OpenMP to bring it to the GPU, that will not make it any better. Yeah? So OpenMP just um, gives you additional features to express parallelism for the host and the device, but your code has to run fast on the device yeah, in order to get good uh, performance. So let's think about what we can do here. Last time we heard about SIMD already. Um, uh, since we started this webinar, we have been discussing the parallel region 
and work sharing constructs. Yeah, so this is what we can do. Yeah, we want we can create a team of threads with a parallel four and use SIMD instructions on every thread in order to express the parallelism uh, on the device. This will um, actually give us reasonable performance, but not perfect performance because still. Now with the parallel region, we have some kind of synchronization semantic, although with the four, we explained that, for example, we have a join at the end of a parallel region, whereas GPUs are multi-level devices. Yeah? We have um, SIMD in terms of individual cores, we have threads, we have thread blocks and so forth. I think I have a, a display slide on that uh, coming up next or in a second and so forth. That means um, if we uh, give an one additional level of parallelism and the runtime to actually modify the degree of parallelism for every level, then we will get better performance. And actually, this is what OpenMP allows us to do. So let me just take a look into the chat. Okay. Yeah, so the OpenMP implementation uh, has different uh, opportunities to generate code for the device. It could do it itse by itself. It could use a host compiler and so forth. This is not specified by uh, the standard. Yeah. So this is a little bit NVIDIA specific. So the device consists, consists of multiple streaming multiprocessors. That means our kernel consists of a grid of uh, what I would call thread blocks. Yeah. Such a thread block is then running on a multiprocessor, and each thread is executed on an individual core. Yeah, and actually, uh, here we might overload the device in order to profit from thread switching and hiding memory latency and so forth. Uh, but this is a topic maybe for next uh, time. This also maps well to the OpenMP synchronization constructs. Yeah? So we can do some kind of synchronization on here. That means this would be the perfect fit for a parallel region. In order then to exploit that, we need um, a set of OpenMP parallel regions. And in OpenMP, we call that a leak. Yeah? So a set of OpenMP parallel regions will be a leak. And this is what we want to express. Um, yeah, we are going to do that with the so-called teams construct. Yeah. Let me just explain the details. So if we want to partition this Saxby loop manually into multiple teams, yeah, a leak running each a parallel region with SIMD, you would have to wrote, write code like that. We need a target to actually transfer the control flow use a teams construct. I will explain that again in a second to actually spawn multiple teams, each one with a single thread only. Yeah, multiple means n teams. Then we would have to introduce this blocking based on a team yeah, here. So that's the increment number of teams. And uh, if n doesn't evenly divide the number of teams, we would have to add remainder loops and so forth. Distributes takes a following loop and actually distribute that over the teams. And then in here, yeah, again, the chunk loop, um, we have the parallel fork actually uh, activating each team. Let me use this term so that we have multiple threads and exploiting uh, SIMD. Yeah? So take this loop, partition it so that it can run, be executed by multiple teams, one the streaming multiprocessor, each stream, uh, team then being executed by multiple threads, yeah, with SIMD, meaning employing all the cores. This is not nice code. This is not what you want to do. This is not what I want to do. Okay, I can't speak for you. Unfortunately, OpenMP uh, allows us to actually combine those constructs. So teams partitions the loop to have multiple teams. Distribute partitions the loop so that there's one thread per team. Parallel four activates this team and we can uh, we do not have to, but we can combine that with SIMD. Yeah? Num teams gives us a number of uh, blocks that we want to employ. We don't have to specify that. Typically, implementations have good default values uh, if you specify a concrete target architecture. And here we have the mapping, oops, I'm sorry, that you already know. 
So we do not have to manually change the loop. I believe that's a good news. So we have a combined construct yeah, that we call Pragma on pay target teams distribute parallel for Simli. Yeah, and this is exploiting this multi-level parallelism on the GPU, uh, in particular for modern uh, GPUs that I tried to explain earlier. This is the same code uh, for Fortran. Teams distribute parallel for Simli still is a lot of keywords. Yeah? The alternative is Pragma on pay target loop, but we will discuss it next time. Yeah? That gives the uh, OpenMP implementation even more freedom. So now we can express parallelism on the device, but we also want to optimize data transfers. And for many codes, yeah, this is a, the bottleneck. If you have to transfer data between the host and the device, basically yeah, by default, if you have a blocking uh, kernel, neither the host nor the device can do anything meaningful. Yeah? So we want to minimize that. So those connections between the host and the accelerator are typically yeah, and I believe that's a given uh, of lower bandwidth than the, uh, the connection of the GPU memory to the GPU and the, typically also the uh, host memory to the host. Yeah? So this is the slowest pass. That means we have to uh, optimize the data transfers for that. PCI Express general, uh, Generation 4 might not be uh, the, the most up-to-date technical solution, but nevertheless, uh, this is the slowest pass. Yeah? So we have to optimize it for that. And optimizing um, means we have two options. One is what we're discussing now. Yeah? Um, we have to transfer only what's actually necessary on the device. I said that before. Sorry, I have a nervous mouse here. And the other is to, uh, if possible, increase the lifetime of the data on the device. That means keep data there if we execute multiple kernels and the same data is used by both multiple kernels. The other option is what we are going to discuss next time. Uh, that is asynchronous kernel offloads and asynchronous data transfers. Yeah, so to allow that to overlap, but, uh, for that we need a few other things uh, discussed and also understood before. So, um, OpenMP maintains this mapping table. That means, uh, as I said before, yeah, as a result of the uh, presence check. So that means it, it knows yeah, which data is already uh, on the device. Uh, and if it doesn't know, it will transfer the data. So with the so-called target region that we're going to, to discuss on the next uh, uh, um, slides, um, we can exploit that and uh, improve um, the data transfer performance by minimizing the amount of data that's actually being uh, transferred. This mapping table also maintains this, uh, this is a technical explanation, the translation between host memory and device memory. Uh, so that means it could be that uh, both devices use the same memory and they're meaning the same address, but this is not a requirement. So in the traditional GPU program model, we have separate memory on the host and the device, and then translation means um, the addresses have to be changed in the code that's being um, executed. Yeah. So I see a question in the chat. Okay, I think that has been answered that's already. Been answered, yes. In okay. Thanks, Thanks, So then let me continue. Yeah. One more question. <laughs> Is there any syntax to shorten OMP target team distribute parallel for SIMD? No, there's no syntax to shorten it. Yeah? There's an alternative construct, uh, OMP loop, but I will come to that, uh, or Michael, maybe Michael, yeah, next time. Yeah, but that's a different concept. <laughs> yeah, it's different semantic. Sometimes yeah. good, sometimes worse. Okay, so. I talked about the target data region briefly. Let me show uh, here in concrete um, code. So what does that mean? The target data region can spend more than a single kernel. Yeah, we will see more examples um, later on. And uh, it will mean that the data environment on the device will have a longer lifetime than the execution of a single kernel namely the begin of the target data region and the end of the target data region. 
We still use a mapping, that means a two at the beginning of the target data region and the two uh, from, yeah, to also include uh, copying back uh, at the end of the target data region. Here, then, we have the actual target. Yeah? That means this is transferring the control flow and hopefully target teams distribute parallel four will be added here because otherwise the performance uh, is set of a single core only. I said that uh, before. So what you're seeing on this slide is that we separated the management of the, of the data environment, uh, making use of the target data, and the kernel offload, you know, the kernel de the device execution um, uh, by means of the target construct. Yeah? With the target, we could introduce additional maps, but this is not possible or necessary in this example. If we have an existing data region, we can also use the target enter data and target exit data constructs yeah, to actually um, yeah, add data uh, from the host to the device or uh, copy it back, uh, depending on the use case. In particular, if you use if you're a C++ programmer, uh, this is important. If you want to target, if you have a target data environment and you want to transfer something in the constructor, you can call target enter data. And in the destructor, uh, for example, uh, you can uh, whatever get the result back from the device, so you can make use of target exit uh, data. Okay. Um, now, how can we actually make use of that to? Uh, reduce the amount of data that's being spent transferring data between the host and the device. So we need a slightly more complex example. You know the current, uh, the SACSP already, but here we have a function called zeros. Yeah, that's actually Q, actually uh, writing zero to a. We have a compute kernel one, not shown here. Yeah, Com uh, we call the SACSP. You know that code already. Compute kernel two, not shown here, and the SACSP again. Whatever compute kernel one and two are doing, yeah, we, let's assume this is something reasonable. So that means we have zeros, compute kernel one, SACSP twice, and compute kernel two. So we have in total four different functions, five kernels to be executed on the device. We know already that SACSP is using X, yeah, just reading it twice. So if you would not make use of the target data, but just doing the mapping here, for the two SACSP operations, X would have to be mapped twice from the host to the device. What we're doing here is now pragma OP target data. We allocate a variable called TMP, yeah, that's being zeros here. We map A and B yeah, at the beginning from the host to the device, and we map C back at the end of the device, uh, of, the, of the kernel. Oh, sorry, of the target data region, yeah, which starts here and ends here. This is the end of example. Yeah. So A, B are mapped here, and T and P is alloc allocated here, and C is being mapped back from the device here, but also mapped to the device here. Yeah. And then we can call zeros, the two compute kernels, and SACSP, um, and uh, uh, it doesn't have to involve any additional transfer between the host and the device. It could, yeah, if necessary, yeah, the target constructs here could include additional maps. We could use target enter data, target enter data, and exit data, but we do not have um, to do that. Yeah. These again are the uh, constructs with their corresponding clauses, malloc to, from, to, from, release and delete, uh, I guess that's clear. And then if, oops, um, same for, uh, ah, I didn't uh, talk about that. And if we have data on a, in a target construct, yeah, we want to, um, we might have to, we might want to update it. So that means uh, data is on the device, something happens on the host, Assuming we have an uh, asynchronous offline, yeah, which we'll learn about next time, something happened on the host and we want to push that update from the host to the device, we can use the target update with a two clause. So it's not the map clause anymore, with a two clause 
end all with a from clause. That means we get an update from the device to the host, yeah, like in an iterative algorithm, get the residual yeah, or something like that. Again, list is a list of, scale of uh, variables here. So that means yeah, we can again update a full variable or just a slice. Remember, um, if we have an array, we can select uh, the number of elements that are being um, yeah, used by the map clause. And that also applies for the to and the from clause. So this allows us to issue a data transfer either from the host to the device or from the device to the host, making use of an existing um, uh, data uh, a device environment on the de data environment on the device that has a longer lifespan uh, span than just a single construct. Here we have an example of that, putting everything together. Target data starts existence here, ends here. Yeah? We are working with a single device only. I hope you get the idea that in, in principle we can use multiple devices. Yeah? We have an allocation of TMP right at the beginning. We map input from the host to the device right at the beginning, and we map the residual back at the end. And um, yeah, so we can leave you can leave the zero here if you just want to map an element. Here we have a target um, that means a kernel. Yeah? So parallel four um, is being executed on the device. Oops, with an update. Oh, sorry, with some computation of input, um, writing or defining actually TMP. This is a target applying to this code only. So that means this one here is being executed on the host. So we update input array on the host, whatever this is doing. But now input has more up to date value on the host. Yeah? That means we say pragma op target update to. Yeah, input is being copied again from the host to the device. And then we do a parallel computation again on the device. Yeah, you see the target construct, we use a reduction here. And we call the final computation, which apparently does a reduction in here, yeah, or which does a reduction in here. And we map rest back from the device to the host here at the very end. Without target data, yeah, more data would have to be transferred. And that means uh, we would have to pay more overhead for our computation. Ah, I think I explained that. Yeah. So the, this is done on the host. Here we have the device flow, the control flow uh, going to the target, meaning the GPU. This is done again from or by the host on the device. And basically, here we are back at the host. Yeah? So that means the map uh, from is being uh, work carried out by the host. That was our introduction. Yeah, I'm happy that I didn't uh, put in more stuff yeah, because the time slot is already up, but it uh, uh, gave you um, an overview about the principles, in particular the control flow between the host and device, the management of the data environment, and the expression of parallelism. We uh, deliberately, oh no, we by intent selected the Jacobi example again uh, to try out your first steps on the GPU. Yeah, this is just an explanation of Jacobi again. Um, so what uh, we propose you to do is to run on the host, get the performance, then task one, get it to the GPU, parallelize only uh, one of the most uh, compute intensive loops, yeah? improve the data environment. So you know Jacobi is interactive code. We have the copying yeah? and the computation. I think I explained it at the beginning. Yeah? So do it without the data environment, do it with the data environment. And then maybe yeah, we can discuss it uh, next time, optimize the scheduling of iterations for the GPU and uh, uh, then compare performance between the uh, CPU and the GPU. If you want to be fair, uh, compare your parallel CPU version with a parallel GPU version. And then we can uh, next time discuss the resulting performance. And actually, uh, if you're really brave, uh, not sure we have, I, I believe we did not have a, a solution for that provided uh, in the archive. You can use multiple GPUs actually. Uh, so if you have two, and if you're 
whatever. If you really want to fight with OpenMP, you can try to use the host and the GPU. But on most systems I used so far, yeah, this will not lead to a performance improvement because the problem at the end of the day is too small. Yeah? You really have to increase it, make it more computationally expensive um, uh, to make that speed up. Yeah? But using two GPUs is possible. That ends my presentation yeah? and brings back the control flow from the device here in Aachen back to Helen. But of course, I'm happy to answer questions if you have some. Yeah, so end of the session, I'm gonna introduce available OpenMP target offload compilers on Perlmutter. Yes. So let me see, um, you see my slides? Yes? Yes. Okay, so let's say what are the available compilers that you can use on Perlmutter. So we have four sets of uh, compilers. Two were provided by vendor. NVIDIA compiler NVHPC uh, and also CCE by uh, Cray HPE. Then there are two open source compilers, LLVM Clan and GCC. How to use NVIDIA compiler? Uh, so you need to module load program environment NVIDIA. And this compiler supports C, C, and Fortran for OpenMP offload. Since um, it's, it's the part of standard environment PRGNV, so you need to use compiler wrappers. Um, little CC and capital CC for CC++ and FTN for Fortran. And then the dash MP equals GPU for OpenMP offload. Just dash MP is for OpenMP on CPU. So make sure you use dash MP equals GPU. And the dash M info um, equals MP accelerator. There are more other options, but this is for OpenMP and GPU offloading in provides more compile time information of the optimization and Factorization, et cetera, offload kernels of your uh, source code for OpenMP. At runtime, you can also set um, NV compiler ACC notify to one or two or other values so that at runtime you'll see the information on the kernel launches, the data transfers from the host to device. To device. That's how you use an NVIDIA compiler. And for um, CCE, programming environment Cray, Again, you use uh, compiler wrappers because those are sort of integrated um, primary user environment. Uh, little CC, un use, why are you using in, uh, the wrappers? Underneath, they are using actual the, 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 the compiler uh, correspondingly. When you have module uh, PRG and VCray, when you use the same wrapper, it'll use the CCE compiler. If have, you have PRG and V-NVIDIA, we use the same wrapper, you will be using NVIDIA compiler. So for the CCE compiler, um, um, for, for C and C++, the flag is dash F OpenMP. For Fortran actually uh, is uh, dash OpenMP uh, is now actually uh, can, be, can be used as well. Originally it used dash H O M P because they're actually Fortran and C++ are having to dive uh, different paths. The, for Fortran it uses its uh, classic Cray compiler. And C, C++ is now based on LLVM clan. So the dash of F OpenMP is more standard. Uh, Fortran, you can use dash H OMP or dash F OpenMP. And make sure you have the dash H no ACC so that uh, it's not just, then you'll be compiling for just OpenMP. It also has a runtime flag. You can set create ACC debug equals one and two and three. And then at runtime, you also see some of the kernel launching, et cetera, information. Oh yeah, one more thing. For GPU, um, like the long directive, target uh, teams distribute OMP, parallel, do, and make sure for Fortran add SIMD because the, the CCE Fortran compiler implementation uses SIMD over OMP, parallel, do for uh, multi-threading parallelism. Um, Clan LVM is only work um, um work uh, available for C and C plus plus compilers, so uh, you use PRG ENV LVM. This is not native. This is actually NERSC supported uh, environment. So with that, you're not using uh, compiler wrappers, little CC and C plus uh, FTN, uh, little CC or capital CC. For this version, Clan, you actually need to use native compiler uh, wrapper native compilers, clan and clan plus plus. 
use FOpenMP, and you also need that OMP targets for the NVPTX. And again, there's a runtime environment variable to set. This is optional, of course. Then the lastly for GCC compiler. And um, we have a uh, with PRG and Miglu, you will see some GCC compilers available, but those uh, do not have the OpenMP offload being um, um, installed. So there's a, a custom version that Rahul having has installed in this directory. So you have to use module use that his module files and then modular GCC offload. Again, you have to use native compilers, GCC, G++, and G4 trend because it supports all three. There's a long um, flag besides standard dash F, F OpenMP and then F offload flags, really long. SM-80 uh, stands for parameter uh, and with, and the uh, A100 uh, GPU nodes. Um, GLMP debug as well. Um, so this compiler, if I show you the last, I'm oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll mention all these four um, different compilers and the uh, summary table at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll comment more. But for, before that, I'll show you how to actually use them. So you would SSH your username at parameter.nurse.gov. If you have a training account, you just use their password. And if you're a regular NERS user, obviously you know how to do that. It is an MFA, multi-factor authentication that's needed. Then you get on a um, GPU node. The GPU node uh, here, if you only use one GPU, there are four GPUs per node. If you only use one GPU so that the whole node can be shared by among multiple users. You you can do dash Q shared and ask only asking a quarter of the available CPU nodes, CPU cores as well. And then for GPU, when you have to dash cap, go asking dash cap to C for GPU, and then have to put a um, your project name, uh, N train five or uh, your regular um, repo. We usually starts with M M one two three four something like that. And then you get on a GPU node. And you would compile and then uh, you would you know run it for CPU, you can set the number of threads on CPU, but otherwise on the GPU, you just run your executable and use some flags. And before that runtime uh, run line, you can set you know some of the environment variables for debugging, as I showed before. And for this, and also a bad script example here, very similar flags here. And same things, but then you can with the script prepared, you can you know s batch your script. After you load um, different environment variables, you can you can compile on the logging node, or you can compile within your batch script. You can hear like I'm sorry, like here. That doesn't allow me. Okay, these two lines compile here. But... So this is last table I've promised. Basically, a summarize of each of the compilers. CCE has two lines: and CCE for Gen CCE C++, different flags um, for NVIDIA um, compiler. CC++ and for Trend supports this wrapper, and LVM supports C and C++ only used in na native compilers. GCC again supports all three and use native compilers. So our recommendation um, is that for a C and C++ and for Trend on um, and on our GPU and parameter GPUs, NVIDIA compiler is the best uh, supported and overall best performance recommended for all three types of codes. And if it's a Fortran code, a CCE Fortran is also recommended. And if it's a um, CC++ code, CLAN uh, LLVM is also recommended. We do not recommend uh, GCC just uh, as of now for performance consideration. And we, I think we touched upon OMP loop, probably we'll, we'll discuss some next session. And this is a column says, which compiler supports OMP loop. So for your exercise um, today, the Jacobi, um, I put in that, I hope people can try. The, there's a, a job script there uh, using the NVIDIA compiler, but one of the tasks is also try different compilers um, based on the slides that I can. So let's see, questions? Oh, okay. Can you mention again, what compiler tool will you use for this GPU exercise? So NVIDIA um, and Site Compute can be used for um, exercise. 
There's also um, if you use create uh, there's also perf tools um, um from HPE that um you can just module load and perf tools even a uh, light version it'll give you um the default compiler uh, up, um, performance results as well, but the best used uh optimized uh the the profiling tools is Nvidia um inside compute. I can put a link um in the chat for the the documentation on parameter. So I think with that, uh, we are good for today, but I would also like to put in a survey link in the chat. Hopefully um, people can help us to with your feedback, which is very uh, welcome that we can use it to, to help improve our future training. I also remind you in the Slack, we can do it now, you know, um, usually we get much better um, responses. <laughs> you delay for a while, sometimes you don't do it. And so Slack is still open. You're welcome to continue asking questions over there. Uh, next session, we think will be more advanced OpenMP. And the last session, that's the next session is session six, advanced open M open MP offload. And the final session is that session seven will be, you know, catch up, catch all of things that we didn't have time to cover, so for, such as there's a part of SIMD, we didn't have time to do that yet, and also some hybrid MPI open MP for the last and session. If there's any topic that you would really like to hear, yeah, we can also bring that in. So, That's true. So know. free to to mention them in the Slack channel, what you want to hear about. Christian and Michael are very flexible. Thank you again, Christian. It's too late um, in Europe. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome.